In the pilot episode of Trumpet Demystified, which you can find in the top right corner in the card if you've not yet seen, we talked about all things pertaining to trumpet mouthpieces. And at several points in that video, I noted that changing a certain factor of a mouthpiece by a few thousandths of an inch is enough to drastically change its sound, feel, or playing experience. As it turns out, the very same is true for the trumpet itself. In part two of the six-part video series that is my senior project for the Gonzaga University Honors Program, I want to tackle something that's historically been a difficult subject in the trumpet industry, and that is the size and shape of the tubing used to manufacture a trumpet. This is a tricky subject for a variety of reasons. First of all, as I mentioned, the factors in this video are oftentimes dependent on a fraction of an inch type basis, and that is too small to be observed by the human eye alone. And second of all, you might have heard me say there, factors, not just one factor, there are many factors at play here, some of them, in my opinion, being vastly overblown in the trumpet community and others unrightfully ignored. And so what I'd like to do with this episode of Trumpet Demystified is to tackle some of the market myths stemming from this subject being rather messy and see if we can better inform up-and-coming players on what to look for for their next purchase. Because if you're going to settle down with a new trumpet, that is a massive financial expenditure regardless of brand or specifications, so it's extremely important to know what kind of a player you are, what you are looking for out of your trumpet playing, and what sort of numbers and garbled mess here best lead to what you're trying to get out of your trumpet playing. The truth is, we're all subtly different, and not everybody deserves to hear the same sales pitch. So, without any further ado, let's discuss. If you recall from last episode, the tightest point of this whole mechanical apparatus is right there. It is the throat of the mouthpiece that tends to come in at 0.1 something of an inch. From there, it expands ever so slightly and inserts into the instrument where we have this point right here, the venturi of the trumpet, or the opening of this lead pipe here. If you look closely, you might be able to see the lead pipe expands in diameter from this slightly smaller width to something a little wider over here. And this is an important point on the trumpet, because from here, all the way through the main tuning slide, all the way through the valve section, and out through a couple inches of the bell tail, the tubing stays a constant diameter on almost all trumpets. And then from here, the tubing flares a little bit. By the time we get to about here, we can actually see some visible expansion going on straight out to the flare of the bell section. But you'll notice that's a lot of the instrument where there is a constant diameter of tubing all the way from here out to about there. And so that is a very important measurement in trumpet design, and it is what we refer to as the bore size of the instrument. Of course, any measurement in this tubing here, any diameter, could be considered a bore size, but the principal bore size of the instrument is located anywhere in this middle section. An easy way to measure it tends to be taking out the second valve slide and measuring it out with a pair of calipers, the inner tube, that is, not the outer tube. The vast majority of trumpets on the market today tend to fall into the industry standard range of a bore size of 0.458 inches to 0.460 inches. That's 458 or 460 thousandths of an inch, with most of those falling right in the middle at 459. That 459 bore was determined by makers like Frank Holton and Vincent Bach to be the best for a middle-of-the-road tone and playing experience. Now, with trumpet bore sizes, much like anything else in the industry, we have the industry standard size from which we can go larger or we can go smaller. Starting on the smaller end of that fence, we have the medium bores of the trumpet industry, which tend to be in the range of 0.438 to 0.454 inches. The general trend in the brass industry as a whole has been for bore sizes to expand over time, so it stands to reason that a lot of medium bores on the market are older instruments like that 90-something-year-old King Liberty hanging behind me on the hook, but we do find medium bores on some newer and more specialty instruments, such as this particular model of Yamaha Intermediate Trumpet, the YTR332, which features a 0.445 inch bore at the valve section, rather than the conventional 14 thousandths larger that most Yamaha trumpets have. Something to note about a trumpet that has a medium bore, but the same size venturi and bell as a larger bore trumpet, is that there's going to be less expansion of tubing on the front half of the instrument, and conversely, a little bit more on the back half of the instrument. This instrument ironically has a bigger bell than a lot of medium larges, so there's quite a lot of expansion from bell tail to bell flare. Now don't let me knock your socks off too badly here, but just like we can go smaller than standard with trumpet bore sizes, we can also go... That's right, larger. This is an example of a large bore trumpet. This is a Bach Stradivarius C trumpet, which is a specialized orchestral instrument, and it has a bore of 462 thousandths of an inch at the valve section. 
Large bores have quite a range to them from 462 to 464 to 468, 472, even a whopping 484 bore like on this Con Director Student Model Cornet. You can check out a video and the card up there on the differences between the trumpet and cornet. That's unrelated to Trumpet Demystified, it just can provide a little bit of extra context if you're a little confused right now. But specifically in context of trumpets, although I'm showing you a specialized C trumpet here, standardized B-flat trumpets do sometimes come in large bores as well, such as certain Bach Stradivarius models, or for instance the Jupiter XO Model 1604. So now that we've set the stage on trumpet bore sizes, let's talk about why we're able to vary them. Now, trumpet players and salespeople alike love to fixate on bore size. You might hear statements like this out in the wild in the trumpet industry. The bore of this trumpet is X thousandths of an inch, allowing it to do Y and Z. Anytime you hear that kind of a statement, pause, take a second, do some further research, maybe watch this video again, and proceed with whatever you're listening to with a cautious, skeptical ear. The bore size of a trumpet measured here, here, there, it doesn't really matter, is just one snapshot of one factor of an incredibly complex and interactive sort of design. And it's very reductionist to say that the playing characteristics of an instrument are dependent on the bore that you measured here. A lot of professional high-octane players will shout from the rooftops about how their large bore trumpet is the holy grail of trumpet design, it's so free to blow through and you can fit so much air through the large bore, and for reasons like this, a lot of people clamor for vintage large bore trumpets. They're some of the most sought after on the market. But consider this with me, if you will. Remember how I said in episode one that that is the tightest point on this entire hollow tubing apparatus, that is the mouthpiece throat? This bore diameter here, be it 434 or 484, tends to be around three times the width of the mouthpiece throat, meaning that in terms of surface area, that hole is one ninth the size or even less than whatever we have here, kind of regardless of what the bore size may be. And if this is what regulates airflow into the instrument, it tends not to matter if we increase or decrease that bore size by three thousandths of an inch in terms of physical airflow through the instrument. But Sam, why is it then that large bore trumpets are so sought after and some players do prefer them, even having tested them objectively or blindly? And that's a fair question. While the large bore trumpet does not physically take more air unless you change the throat of the mouthpiece than a medium large or a medium bore trumpet, it can take more energy from the player. And I understand we're now talking about less concrete terms, but that's essentially how far you can push a trumpet while you're playing it. Large bore trumpets tend to be capable of playing with a little bit more spice in the sound, shall we say. They tend to be able to put a couple extra decibels on the sound, and they can play a little bit louder without really breaking up their tone quality. And conversely, medium bore trumpets, which are smaller than medium large, such as this one here, tend to be capable of a little bit more finesse in the softer dynamics, or can just flat out play a little bit softer and with a little bit less edge in the sound. This notion that larger bores are more free-blowing or take more air is one of those market myths that I think it's of paramount importance to dispel. Each of us is unique as a player and in the way we interact with instruments, so it's extremely important to know how we play, how we interact with the instrument, and what sort of instrument we should be looking for for the best results. And it's important not to just listen to other people's experiences and parrot them as your own. If it were the case that large bore equals more air equals bigger sound, we'd all be playing larger bore trumpets, and bore sizes would just be growing with time infinitely. You know, we'd be playing on 500 bores pretty soon. But that's not the case, because everybody functions differently. You know who doesn't sound good on large bore B-flat trumpets? This guy. I really don't. My main trumpet is a Yamaha 8310Z, which I've played for a number of years, and it, like this one, has an unconventionally small 445 bore, smaller than the industry standard of 459, let alone the large bores that are .462 or .468 or so on. So it's important that not everybody tries to make a certain equipment choice work for them. Keep in mind, one of the biggest selling points of the 8310Z is that it's extremely free-blowing, especially in the upper register. Doesn't seem to be because of the bore size. For what it's worth, this is also just my personal experience, but I personally find bores larger than 459 to have some intrinsic pitch issues. Their high G tends to sit quite sharp, their in the staff E tends to sit a little bit flatter than usual, and it's harder for me on a large bore to manipulate that pitch back into place where it should be. But again, that's just my experience. I don't know if other people have experienced that, although physics would generally indicate that that is an issue with larger bore instruments. So now we've thoroughly done to death the topic of bore size on the trumpet, but what about the topic of bore shape? If anything, the shape of the bore is much more influential than the size of the bore at any one point in determining how a trumpet is going to play. 
In brass design, there are generally two types of tubing we can work with, if we really want to simplify it to black and white. There is cylindrical tubing, which, much like the cylinder from which it gets its name, stays a constant diameter throughout. And then there is conical tubing, which, much like the cone that it gets its name from, tapers outward, whether straight or a little bit more flared, like that. Generally, the more conical your tubing is, the more compacted your intonation is, as in low notes get sharper, high notes get flatter, and vice versa. The more cylindrical and straight through your tubing is, the higher your high notes get and the lower your low notes get. And so you have to correct appropriately on any brass instrument. If you want an example of a lot of conical tubing on one instrument, take a look at the trumpet's bigger, fatter cousin, the flugelhorn. The valve section of the flugelhorn, just like of the trumpet, has a bore size associated with it, although generally smaller than the trumpet because of how little time there is between the mouthpiece and the valve section. But then, straight afterward, we can visibly see just how much that bore is expanding to the point that we get around here, the bell throat is massive, and the bell flare is bigger than anything you come by on a regular trumpet. The trumpet, by comparison, is much more cylindrical. Remember the fact that, generally speaking, we have a constant diameter from here all the way to a couple inches of the bell tail. Now, of course, every modern brass instrument is a mix of conical and cylindrical tubing. For instance, conical, cylindrical, conical. But it's important to consider that for the trumpet, there is quite a lot of conical tubing in the mix. And that, I think, leads nicely into our discussion of the trumpet bell. In crude terms, yes, the trumpet has a bell, so as to amplify the noise and the vibrations that you put into the instrument. But the shape and size and profile of this bell and the way it flares out has profound impacts on the actual sound that you hear once it exits the instrument and projects into the space in front of you. There are two things we can look at here. Firstly, this pre-flare section, where we do visibly see that the tubing is getting wider, but it's a little hard to quantify because of this constant taper. This is what we refer to as the bell throat. And then, over here where it flares out rapidly, shockingly, we call the bell flare. And this is obviously a little more quantifiable, just because this is one number that you can take a measurement of, just as a diameter of the circle that is your bell. The throat of the bell, aside from making it slightly annoying to find tailor-made mutes for your instrument, particularly if it's a little bit large, like this one, regulates how direct or diffuse your sound is. A wider throat, like this one, allows for a little bit more diffusivity in your sound. Think of spreading peanut butter on a piece of bread with a knife, whereas a narrower throat, understandably, creates a more direct and punchy sort of sound. Meanwhile, the width of the bell flare has some bearing on these things, but more so than the breadth or the warmth of the sound, it tends to regulate the size of the sound. The bigger a bell you have, the more vibration you have coming off of it. Therefore, the more energy it takes to start and sustain the vibration, but generally, the bigger of a sound you get out of it. That King Liberty I keep directing your eyes to, it has a very uniquely small bell, as was characteristic of these old jazz-style trumpets. And so they not only produce a very direct and bright sound, but the sound is a little bit thinner and more pointed. Now believe me, in such a complex, interwoven, and frankly finicky field as trumpet design, even such a lengthy, verbose discussion as this one about things like bores and bells can only brush the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more that could be said, not just by me, but by actual industry experts, but to maintain some level of digestibility here, this is where we're going to call it on episode 2 out of 6 of Trumpet Demystified. Stay tuned for episodes 3 through 6 coming very soon, where we're going to take closer looks at some other elements of trumpet design that interact with the elements we've talked about in this video to yield something like this. Until next time, thank you for watching, and stay tuned.